Hi, I'm Kenny Yates, and this is Nuggets of Truth. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he spoke in parables to the people, oftentimes describing or making an analogy for the kingdom of heaven. One of his most memorable parables is that of the laborers in the vineyard, found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. Would you turn with me now, please, to Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the workplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those worked first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge me my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. You know, at first glance, this parable seems to be referring to the gift of life since every believer will receive the same crown of life. But notice what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This parable, then, is talking about a reward or a payment for work done and not a gift, not a free gift. This is payment, as I said, for work done. Eternal life is not a payment. It is a gift so that no man can boast. So it cannot be talking about that. It is all about faith and has nothing at all to do with works. So the parable says that the kingdom of heaven is like a master who owns a vineyard and hires laborers to work the vineyard. Each gets paid the same, a denarius a day, which was the fair wage of a hired worker for a full day's work in those days. See, these workers received a denarius regardless of the time that they started, regardless of the amount of work that they did, regardless of how much work they did. They all got paid the same amount of um, for working in the vineyard. In fact, the 11th hour workers are those whom Jesus refers to as welcoming a prophet or righteous person, as in Matthew chapter 10. Although they themselves did not do the actual work in the fields, they didn't go out and, and be persecuted or, or endure hardships, but they supported those who did. They either supported them with prayers or they supported them with finances or they supported them with both. Therefore, they are partaken in the work or the job that was done. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 through 42. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he's a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives 
gives one of these little little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is also the reason why the writer of the book of Hebrews encourages us, encourages the body of Christ, the church, us Christians to be hospitable. Look at what he said or what he wrote in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. He said, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, do you th- even think Think that God will not pay you back for the work that you have done? Of course he will. He he will give you whatever you work for. God is not one who is begrudging. He will not keep back wages from you. If you work even in the slightest, God will reward you and he'll reward you much, much more than what you actually work to what you actually put in. Paul said that these little things, these minor things, these minor afflictions, mind this man was beaten with rods and imprisoned and stoned to death and and he, he was always persecuted by the Jews and, uh, and the Jewish leaders. And he said, these light afflictions, they can't even compare with what God has in store for us. In other words, God always repays us more than what we put in. Praise the Lord. So these represents those who started work at the 11th hour. Now, I want you to notice this. The master is God and the vineyard is the world. The laborers are those who hearken to the clarion call of Jesus to work in the harvest fields. In other words, those who save souls through their faithful teaching of the word or the faithful preaching of the word or the faithful witnessing uh, uh, of us who believe when we tell our testimony, when we tell those of the goodness of Jesus. And it also includes those who support those workers support missionaries, support those pastors when they pay their tithe. They, they, they're sowing in these fields and they're, they're going to be reaping the reward of the soil that they have been sowing in. They will not sow or, or, or help sow and not reap or eat from, from the harvest that is coming. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let us back up just a little bit so I can lay a foundation. Notice that the first worker was told how much they would earn, a denarius for the day's wage. But the others were not told the amount that they would be paid, only that they would be paid what was fair. This is very important, so keep that in mind. I want you also to notice that there are five sets of workers. The number five represents the church, the body of Christ. So one, one set of workers were early in the morning. That was those who were were there from the beginning, those who were Christians all their lives. Then he went out on the third hour, which would be 9 9 a.m. or time. Then they had the set of, of workers that went out at the, that started at the sixth hour, which would be 12 p.m. Then the ninth hour, 3 p.m. And then the, the eleventh hour. Now this eleventh hour represents the last minute laborers, those who may get saved um, just in, in their old age, but now they're they're they're, they're paying tithes, they're they're supporting missionaries, they're getting involved in sowing and therefore they too will reap. Now sowing isn't always um, financial. It can be through prayer. When you labor in prayer for for these missionaries and the, the persecuted church, those who are laying down their lives for the name of Jesus. So the last last hired workers were called and paid first, and the first hired was called and paid last, but they were all paid the same wage, a denarius. Some people will accept Jesus even past the 11th hour and does not have time to work in the vineyard. They will accept Jesus on their, on their deathbed. 
This parable is not talking about those people. They, they will still be saved. They will still receive eternal life. That is for sure because it is a free gift through faith in Jesus. Once you accept Jesus, you will receive the crown of life. But they will not receive a reward for work done because they have done no, no work. That is why Jesus said, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. See, my daughter, Ari, she, she gave me some good insight in this. This, the night is coming statement. She pointed out or pointed to the scripture that says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Now, love concurs with faith. In other words, you cannot have faith without love and you won't have love without faith. So in the last days, the love of many will grow cold, meaning that the love that dwells inside of the majority will grow cold. So the majority of the people will have no love within them. And because of this, there will be no faith or very little faith dwelling within them. And, and, and these people, if they have no love, they will have no faith. And this is why Jesus asked the question in Luke, chapter 18, verse 7 through 8. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus told this parable to teach that believers should always pray and not give up because in the end times, there will be no justice for his people. They will be persecuted. They'll be thrown in prison. They will be murdered. They will, they, they, they will be martyred for the sake of of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel. But if we pray and not lose heart, God himself will vindicate us and he'll give us the power to endure all of that, that persecution that will arise upon the earth in the last days. The problem is, will he find the kind of faith that he's looking for when he returns? That's the problem. It's like Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. It says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogues. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is, the king, what is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. In other words, they refused to believe in Jesus. Even though they heard all the great things that he had been doing, they heard the teaching that he was now teaching them. He taught with authority. He taught with wisdom. And yet they took offense at him because he was one of their own. There was He was a hometown boy and they took offense. See, Jesus' whole experience in his hometown can be summed up in one verse. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They took offense at him. 
because it, it was all about jealousy. Maybe it, it, it might have been something more, something else. Nevertheless, those hometown folk took offense and stepped into a period of spiritual darkness because they would not let the light of Jesus shine upon them. Their love had grown cold. Therefore, their faith had dwindled as well, leaving them without any kind of discernment that their Messiah and their healer was standing there before them. And they missed out on great miracles, great healings that could have been. They were, they missed out on it because of their lack of, uh, of faith, because of their unbelief. Jesus, in turn, could do very few miracles. All he could do was maybe lay his hand upon a few people and, uh, and got them healed. But the miracles that he wanted to do, the miracles that he could have done, were stomped. They, they were stifled because the people refused to believe. This isn't a lack of power of God. God, power didn't lack. This isn't a lack of Jesus' faith. This is the lack of faith that people have in God, as well as the love that they have for their God. I recently was reading a, a church's website that stated that one of the codes that they live and work by is by the code that they have labeled, we think inside the box. This is given with a short explanation of it's about embracing limitation, quote unquote. On the surface, this sounds good. It sounds like they're embracing a chapter out of Paul's book on humility, but this isn't humility. This is limiting God by embracing their own limitations. But we must remember when we are weak, then we are strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Therefore, we must embrace that. 2 Corinthians, we must embrace our weakness because then we are made strong through Jesus Christ that we should embrace. We don't embrace our weaknesses and just leave it there to, 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 to limitations. We don't embrace our limitations. All things are possible for him who believes. Our God isn't limited. He doesn't work in the realm of possibilities. He doesn't even work in maybes. God works and dwells in the realm of impossibility. He calls into existence those things that do not exist. Look at how Jesus encourages his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Did you catch that? With man, and man's limitations, there are things such as impossibilities. But with God and his unlimited power, there's no such thing as impossible. All things are possible with God. Jesus even takes it a step further and explains that there is only one way to access the impossibility. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And again, we see the confirmation in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Therefore, it isn't because God's power has dwindled that we no longer see miracles like, like they did in the first church. It isn't because we need a second outpouring of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God dwells inside of us right now. It isn't because the power of God was removed after the apostles. No, the power of the Spirit remains with the Spirit. If the Spirit wasn't removed, then the power was not removed. If the Spirit is here, then His power is here. So the same power that they had and they worked in is the same power that we should have and be working in today, but because the love of many has waxed cold. 
We no longer spend nights in, in prayer and fasting. We no longer, churches don't even fast anymore. They don't pray through the night. They don't even pray through periods. They, they, the average time a Christian prays is less than seven minutes a day. Now, think about that. What if you were spending 10 or even 15 minutes a day com conversing with your spouse? How long do you believe that marriage would, end, would last? Exactly. See, it's not because the power ha has departed or the spirit has departed. It's because our love has begun to grow cold. We're reaching those days prophesied about 2,000 years ago by Jesus himself. We're getting closer and closer to those days as the church begins to love and seek after the world instead of loving and seeking after Christ. And as we stated before, without love, there can be no faith. Without faith, there can be no miracles. There can be no healings. There can be no work. But don't be discouraged. We haven't reached that time yet. It is still day. There is still faith upon the earth. There is still love. And I still believe that a time of revival where, where, where the healing uh, and and the power of God is going to be moving in signs and wonders and miracles. And everyone who wants a healing will be healed. Everyone who, 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 who wants deliverance will be delivered. And the power of God will be poured out. Because God said that in the last days he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And those last days has not ended. Those last days are still happening. And we are in those last days. So we must receive and we must act. We must start to love again. Get back to our first love. So what, what, what we need to do, as I said, is get back to our first love and get away from, from those churches who, who are watering down the gospel and who, who are being offended by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because there are still those who are seeking the whole gospel of God, regardless of how hard those who call themselves Christians try to condemn them and try to stop out their faith and try to quench the Holy Spirit and quench the fire. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. So has the kingdom of God suddenly not exist anymore since the last apostle died? Certainly not. The kingdom of God is still alive and well. And if the kingdom of God is still alive and well, then his power is still alive and well. Because the kingdom of God isn't based on these fancy words and, 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 and these, the, these, these rock star preachers, but it is based on power. It's, a, it's based on, on, on and rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, when we spend time in worship and spend time in prayer and spend time with the Holy Spirit speaking to our, our Heavenly Father, speaking to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look at how Paul classified these kinds of people who claim to be Christians but, but deny the power in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiven, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its powers, have nothing to do with such people. King James says, from such turn away. Paul not only warns us to stay away from people that have a form of godliness but deny his power, but he lumped them in with those who are treacherous, slanderous, unholy, and without love. Why? Because there are those who are pushing us into a time of darkness. They're pushing us into the night when no one can, can, can work because the love of the majority has grown cold and with it, faith has grown cold. In fact, 
faith leaves, it departs. And when there is no faith, there are no miracles. There are no healings. There is no work. And if there is no work, then the night has come and the end is upon us and no soul can be saved. This now begs the question, how did the one who worked only one hour receive the same payment as the one who worked 12 hours? God doesn't base his rewards on a system of length of service. He bases his, his rewards on a system of did and did not. Did you work or did you not work? That is the question. So, to sum everything up really quickly, all who work for the Lord in his vineyard will be paid the same reward regardless of length of time doing this work. Why? Because it's not about how long you've served, but it's all about you serving. If you served, you will be paid. Therefore, we must work while it is still day because the night is coming when no one can work. When will night come? When the love of God begins to wax cold. Then the faith in God begins to dwindle. When the faith in God begins to dwindle, there are no miracles. There are no healings. There's no work being done. There's no salvation being had. When there is no work being done, the night has come and no one will be able to work. This is because miracles, healing, signs, and wonders are based not on the lim limitlessness of God, but on the limited faith of man, the vessel by which God performs these supernatural events. When this happens, the end has come. So look up, thy redemption draweth nigh. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates, and this is Nuggets of Truth. Be blessed and stay blessed.